Right, last week we were looking at the brain stem. This week I thought, let's go really back to basics because I can do basics. We're going to look at the, cere the cerebral hemispheres. We're going to look at the cerebrum, but just the lumpy bumpy bits, right? The absolute basics. Um, I might mention what each bit does, but it, it really is just recognizing the folds and the lumps and the bumps and that sort of thing. All right? So I often say that anatomy is interesting because anatomy is us, right? It's all about us. But there's nothing more us than this bit. So the anatomy of this bit is really the anatomy of us, right? In here, in the cerebrum, this is responsible for receiving all of the sensory input, deciding whether it's useful, deciding what to do with it. Um, you know, this is where your impulses come from, this is where your control over your impulses come from, this is where your personality is, everything that is you is in here. And the other thing, of course, is you can actually point the different parts of the sweet. I know it's a physical thing, you can see it's a physical thing, but when the neuroscientists are teaching you neuroscience, you forget that it's a physical thing, don't you? Um, but you can point to different parts of the brain and say what, part of, what that part of the brain is responsible for. And this is largely found out, of course, because damage to different parts of the brain has caused different problems. Damage to this part of the brain can change your personality. It can change who you are, a physical ch Other facts then, um, there are, what, a hundred billion neurons in the central nervous system? Maybe 120, it's an estimate, right? People guesstimate these things. Um, and around, there are around 20 to 26 billion neurons just in the cerebrum. That is literally too big a number for you to get your head around. You think you know what 100 billion neurons look? You haven't got a, 100 billion, is it? Anyway, it's all in there. So the reason this is so folded, the reason it looks like it does is because the gray matter is on the outside and the gray matter are collections of neuron cell bodies, connections and stuff, and the white matter is more internal. The white matter, that's the myelinated neurons. And the reason this is so folded is to give more surface area for the grey matter. So there's, there's more of you, right? Fun fact, did you do the maths? If there are a hundred odd billion neurons in the central nervous system and only 20, 26 billion neurons in the cerebral hemispheres, where's the rest? There are around 70 billion neurons in this little bit, in the cerebellum. Why is that then? Well, look it up, we're not doing the cerebellum, we're doing the cerebrum. The other cells in the cerebrum and elsewhere in the central nervous system are glial cells. Glial cells are the supporting cells for the neurons. So the, the raised folds that we see in the cerebral hemisphere, there are two cerebral hemispheres, I should probably say, but you knew that already, right? The raised folds are called gyri, that's the plural, so a raised fold is a gyrus, and then the grooves in between the gyri, each groove is a sulcus. Lots of sulky, uh, lots of sul lots of sulcus is a sul What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the major lobes and the major sulky. So there are what, four major lobes, four major sulky, shouldn't take too long. The small features on the brain, like the small gyri and the sulci, they actually vary quite a bit between people, um, but the major features are fairly consistent. The size of the brain varies as well, which of course makes sense because we are different sizes. We've got different sized heads, different sized craniums, right? Um, funny thing is that the size of the brain is not related to the size of the intellect. Why is that then? Uh, this is the anterior part of the brain. We should do anterior, posterior, rostral, caudal later, just as a check, right? But look, there's, there's the brain stem, there's the cerebellum, so this is posterior, this is anterior. So this, this lobe here, this is the frontal lobe, and as we move back here, this is the parietal lobe. So frontal, parietal, parietal meaning, meaning the wall, as in like the wall of the skull. This is the temporal lobe here, Temporal, we've talked about temporal before, haven't we? <laughs> Can you remember what temporal? Uh, why is it called temporal? Temporal refers to the, uh, the progress of time, right? It refers to time. This is the temporal region. Why does it get called the temporal region? It's because this is the area where men start to go gray first. It shows the passage of time. So we got called the temporal region. Everything else got named after that, right? Because, because of that. 
Um, all right, so temporal region, temporal lobe here, which sticks out here, and then this is the occipital lobe back here, occipital posteriorly. So some of these lobes are separated nicely by fairly deep sulci, and some of them not so much. So between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe, we have this central sulcus here running continuously from the midline around to this sulcus here. So this is the lateral sulcus between the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. So that was easy, lateral sulcus. And the central sulcus is an important landmark. When you look at other bits of the brain, remember the central sulcus because you'll see there's important stuff nearby. All right. Now, whoop. Now the other two are not so easy. So there's, um, there's supposedly a sulcus between the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe. Um, I, I'm not even sure if you're supposed to be able to see it laterally. Uh, we take this one apart. So frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. Uh, there's, you kind of see that groove there. There's a sulcus there. Maybe that is the parieto occipital sulcus. Maybe. Maybe. This is a plastic model, so. You know, um, it is another kind of, it looks a bit small to me, but it looks like it's in the right, uh, like I say, it's a little bit variable, but there is a sulcus between the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe that gets called the parieto-occipital sulcus. Typically, when I describe where the occipital lobe is, and the textbooks as well, not just me, uh, the occipital lobe is deep to the occipital bone, all right? Um, the other sulcus of the four is here. This is the cingulate sulcus. Uh, running around, so this is a mid-sagittal section running around in there. So that's it, four lobes, four major sulci. Easy, right? The other interesting thing is, of course, we've got two cerebral hemispheres, left and right. Forget all that stuff about left-sided dominant being artsy or whatever that is. The left and right do have slightly different jobs, but they all work together. That's the other important thing is that although we've got these four lobes, all of these four lobes do different things, but they all work together. That information processing thing is a, is a linked up continuous thing. And the left and right sides are linked. And this is what the white matter is all about. That goes like that. So this is the corpus callosum. This is a thick tract, a thick band of white matter going across the two cerebral hemispheres like that. And that's what links the two cerebral hemispheres. You get some really unfortunate and strange effects if the corpus callosum gets cut. Um, we have the anterior commissure and posterior commissure at either ends, and those are also connecting the two sides. And that's all I'm going to say about it. That is a feature. The, the corpus callosum, white matter, myelinated neurons connecting the two hemispheres. So not only are the different parts of each hemisphere working together, but the two cerebral hemispheres are working together as well. The other thing we can see is that if, the, if this is the cerebrum up here, it's, it's surrounding, it's around and over the top of, this is the thalamus here, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. When people talk about the diencephalon, or maybe diencephalon, that's what they're talking about. So the brainstem comes up here, there's the diencephalon. Brainstem also goes out to the cerebral hemispheres. Cerebral hemispheres out here. Okay. I need a fish. Fish. Where am I going to get a fish? I forgot. I have got a fish. <laughs> All right. You know, I've got a 3D printer on my office right now. I've been 3D printing mostly anatomical things, but I've 3D printed a fish. All right. What's a fish got to do with this, the cerebrum? Well, um, it's mostly to do with the terminology I mentioned earlier. Now, you know that we talk about superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, right? But in neuroscience, they often also talk about dorsal, ventral, rostral, and caudal. Now, with the fish, its central nervous system is in one long straight line. It's in, it's in a straight line, right? Its brain is at this end, spinal cord comes straight out of it, its eyes are kind of pointing that way, right? It's, a, it's a, one continuous straight tube that's bigger at this end. 
Now with a fish, you know that a fish has got a dorsal fin, right? Sharks have got dorsal fins. They've got dorsal fins here. So this would be dorsal. In, the, in us, that's dorsal. Um, and this would be ventral in the fish. This would be ventral in us. Now, the fish's central nervous system, if it's closer to the tail, we say that is towards the caudal end, or it is caudal of something else. Now, the word rostral means beak. Uh, but if, if, the, if the central nervous system is close to the, closer to the nose end, the fish have noses. What a, that was a bad example, wasn't it? Fish don't have noses. Anyway, if the central nervous system is closer to the beak end of the fish, then we call that rostral. Now, in humans, what's happened is that straight nervous system has folded. We have a, we have a flexure here, right? So instead of that central nervous system going up, it's, the best way to imagine that is because our eyes aren't up there in line with our spinal cord. Our eyes are like this, right? So the, the central nervous system goes like this. There's a cephalic or cephalic flexure, and then our eyes are that way, right? There's a fold in our central nervous system, which means when you apply the rostral, caudal, dorsal, ventral of the central nervous system from other animals to the human, it gets a little bit confusing. But you've got to imagine that it's folded over like this. So this would be rostral, here's the beak. So the frontal lobe is rostral to the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is caudal to the frontal lobe. And likewise, we continue down the central nervous system like this. So in fact, the, you can say that the occipital lobe is rostral to the brain stem, right? Because it's, it's further up this way, it's just folded over, does that make sense? The brain stem is caudal to the cerebrum, all right? And then dorsal ventral, so the spinal cord, this is the dorsal side, sorry, with the spinal cord, this is the dorsal side, this is the ventral side, as this folds over then, this becomes the dorsal side and this becomes the ventral side. I know it's, it's almost unnecessarily confusing, which is why really we should use anterior, inferior, superior, um, anterior, inferior, superior, posterior, but you will come across dorsal, ventral, rostral, caudal, and that's what it means. Think of the fish and a fold in the central nervous system in humans, because you know, we're stood upright and, and stuff, okay? That's another thing that I know um, students tend to get stuck over. So if that's, if that solved your problem, or if you never had that problem in the first place, brilliant, awesome. That's it. Um, hopefully a fairly clear look at the cerebral hemispheres, their lobes, the main sulky, and a little bit about the terms of gyri, sulky, gray matter, white matter, and that sort of thing. All right, cool. Right, see you guys next week. Maybe?